Today, we're going to look at financial statements and how we use them in finance. I realize that you have some prior experience with four financial statements in your accounting classes, so I'm going to direct my coverage to the ones we primarily care about in finance, notably the balance sheet and the income statement. We'll also talk about the difference between book and market value of equity. Now, just for reference, I've posted a spreadsheet which contains some of the examples I'm going to use in this lecture uh, to our Canvas site, so please feel free to make use of it, and it also has a lot of other information that I don't have time to talk about in our lectures. So I'll reference it several times today, and it's simply called Chapter 2 Examples. There are many reports firms provide to regulators and the public. The most basic of these reports is the annual report. The annual report sometimes known as the 10K, is a report every firm is required to provide to the SEC. It provides information on the firm's financial statements, the members of the management team and the board of directors, and the risks associated with the firm's operations. This report also always contains a Management Discussion and Analysis Statement, or MDNA Statement for short, in which the firm's management details current and possible future performance. Sometimes, a firm will provide an additional, more colorful and less technical document to shareholders. However, the 10K is required to be reported to the SEC. If you're interested in viewing one of these 10K documents, you can go to the SEC's website and view them directly. The SEC has a data repository called the Edgar Database, where you can view not only the 10K, but most other documents publicly traded firms provide to the agency. Another common report is the quarterly report, or 8K. The 8K provides information on quarterly performance, but it's usually less detailed than the 10K. Investors use the information contained in an annual report to form expectations about future earnings and dividends. There are many ways to analyze this document, from simply looking at individual numbers to examining the risks highlighted by management, to using sophisticated computer programs to analyze the tone of the financial statements. The 10K is one of the best places to gain insight into the behavior and thought process of firm management. If the financial statements in these documents are inaccurate, then the firm risks a shareholder lawsuit or worse, so the firm has the incentive to be as forthcoming as possible. We have four basic financial statements, the balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of cash flows, and the statement of retained earnings. In finance, because we care about cash flows as opposed to accounting earnings, we often just focus on the balance sheet and the income statement. The cash flows we care about in finance are different than the cash flows in the statement of cash flows. The reason we care primarily about the balance sheet and income statement in finance is because these two documents allow us to calculate what are called free cash flows, which we'll talk about later in this class. The balance sheet, which provides a snapshot of all of the firm's assets and liabilities at a point in time, gives us our working capital and capital expenditures measures, while the income statement provides the earnings before interest and taxes, depreciation, and other tax measures that we use to actually calculate these free cash flows. The balance sheet provides the book value of all of a firm's assets, liabilities, and equity at a singular point in time. The phrase book value means that the values reflected are the historical value, adjusted for depreciation. On the left-hand side of the balance sheet, assets are arranged based on how liquid the assets are. The most liquid assets are cash and accounts receivable, which are sales that have been made but for which you have not been paid. Fixed assets, which include the book value or price of the assets minus any accumulated depreciation, are typically seen as less liquid. Fixed assets include property, plant, and equipment owned by the firm. On the right-hand side of any balance sheet, you're going to see the liabilities and stockholders' equity. Now, assets minus liabilities is the book or stockholders' equity. We'll talk about that in a few seconds. All right, here I've put up an example of what you would frequently see on a balance sheet. Current assets in the top left-hand are assets that can be quickly liquidated or sold off. Typically, we say that these assets can be sold off in less than a year. These include the common line item statements like cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. The sum of these assets is our total current assets. Below current assets, we have fixed assets. As I said earlier, these include property, plant, and equipment. But this also includes trademarks, copyrights, patents, and goodwill. 
the valuation of trademarks, patents, and copyrights depends on whether they were acquired by our company. If a patent, copyright, or trademark was acquired by our company, we could report it on the balance sheet according to GAAP principles. If it was created internally, we can't. The last line item, goodwill, refers to the premium paid to an acquisition target. Goodwill refers to any assets whose value cannot be separate from the acquired company. An example of goodwill would be if we purchased a company without intangible assets, like patents, whose market cap was $1 million, and we purchased it for $1.5 million. The additional $500,000 premium for the controlling stake of that company would be reported here under goodwill. On the liabilities and stockholders' equity side, we separate liabilities based on whether they have maturities of one year or less. Current liabilities, or liabilities with a maturity of a year or less, are often accounts payable, or assets we've purchased but not paid for, and short-term notes. A short-term note would be something like a six-month bond. We also report the current payments we will need to make on our long-term bonds. Long-term liabilities are reported, obviously, under the long-term liability section. The amounts reported on these debt issuances are typically the amount we still owe. The amount we owe is determined using the time value of money. Finally, we have the stockholder or shareholder's equity, which is the line item which makes the assets and the liability sections balance. The current assets minus current liabilities has a specific name, net working capital. We generally want to have positive net working capital at any point in time. A positive net working capital means that we have the ability to pay off all short-term obligations without liquidating assets that would need to be sold at a discount in order to be sold off quickly. However, we don't want a net working capital that is too positive. That would indicate that we have not effectively managed our assets or that we should return cash to shareholders in the form of either a dividend or a share repurchase. Positive net working capital indicates that we are quote unquote liquid, meaning that we can convert a significant amount of assets into cash very quickly without a discount. If we had to liquidate a fixed asset like a factory quickly in order to raise cash, we might have to sell the factory for, say, half of what it might be worth. So there's a big benefit to being at least somewhat liquid. Just a few final points on the balance sheet. First, the combination of goodwill, patents, trademarks, and other assets which cannot be touched or held is referred to as the firm's intangible assets. Not every firm will have these line items on their balance sheet. Typically, Firms which produce commodities like oil or paper and have never acquired other companies will not have any intangible assets. Meanwhile, drug companies which make a large number of acquisitions, both of patents and whole companies, will typically have very large intangible assets. In the long-term liabilities section, a firm can have numerous long-term bonds, which is what we see here. Let's take a look at an example of how we actually use the balance sheet in practice. So I've gone ahead and populated a basic balance sheet. Now let's assume we've just received a $300 order for new tires. To produce these tires, we'd likely need to raise some new cash either through a debt or equity issuance. Now let's assume that we borrow the full $300 using a two-year debt issuance. This means that the amount of long-term debt we now owe is increased by $300. On the left hand side, since let's say we've already attracted a buyer, the finished product would not be listed as inventory. Instead, it would either be listed as cash, if our buyer paid cash, or as accounts receivable, meaning that we gave our buyer the tires with the expectation that they would pay for those tires in the near future, and we expect cash in the near future. So notice that with the addition of the $300 order, our accounts receivable increased by $300 and our long-term debt increased by $300 as well. Down there at the bottom, both our total assets and our total liabilities increased by $300, reflecting the increase on both sides of the balance sheet. Now let's take a look at an added example. I've placed a spreadsheet on our Canvas site containing the balance sheet and the income statement of Google for fiscal year 2013 with my comments and notes added so you can get a sense of what a more realistic, more complicated set of financial statements looks like. I pulled these annual statements directly from Google Finance, but you can also get 
these statements directly from the SEC's Edgar website or even Bloomberg if you have access to uh, Bloomberg Terminal. So here we have Google's balance sheet as of 12-31-2012. Like I mentioned earlier, this balance sheet is a snapshot of all of Google's current accounts as of this point in time. So we have their total assets, their total liabilities, a breakdown of all of their liabilities, uh, and then finally their total equity. Typically what you'll see below total liabilities and shareholders equity is that a firm will report its total common shares outstanding right here. So Google has about 671 million shares outstanding. So feel free to go through that on your own. Now let's look at an example of how we actually calculate line items on the balance sheet. So here's a very simple example. Your firm has current assets of $500, shareholders equity of $1,000, short-term liabilities of $500, and fixed assets of $2,000. What is the book value of the firm's long-term liabilities? Well, we know that total assets represents the combination of both current and long-term or fixed assets. So we can calculate total assets based on the numbers we're given, $500 for current assets and one and two thousand dollars for fixed assets for a total of twenty five hundred we know our total liabilities is a combination of total assets minus shareholders equity that's our basic formula in uh, with regard to our balance sheet total assets equals total liabilities plus shareholders equity so we can calculate our total liabilities by simply taking our total assets of twenty five hundred minus our shareholders equity of one thousand to give us fifteen hundred now to get our long-term liabilities of the firm, all we have to do is take our total liabilities minus our short-term liabilities. And in this problem, we know that our short-term liabilities are $500. This leaves us with $1,000 of total long-term liabilities. All right, let's take a look at another example that requires us to use the line items on the balance sheet. So in this example, we have Apple, and Apple's networking capital is currently $5 billion. The firm's current liabilities are $20 billion. If the firm's accounts receivable and inventory are both $10 billion, how much cash does Apple have on hand? Well, we can use our basic formulas from our intro, to, intro accounting class to calculate this. So we know that networking capital is current assets minus current liabilities, and we have networking capital of $5 billion. Now, because we have this networking capital formula, all we have to do is take our current liabilities over to the left-hand side of our networking capital equation, and we find that current assets total $25 billion. Now, current assets are really just the combination of cash, accounts receivable, and inventory. Those are really our three main components to current assets. And if those total $25 billion, and we know that we have $10 billion in accounts receivable and $10 billion in inventory, that means that we must have $5 billion in cash. Problem solved. The final light item on the balance sheet is book or shareholders equity. We often refer to book equity as the historical value of a firm's equity because it tells us the value of historical assets minus historical liabilities. This number is extremely different from the market value or market cap of a firm's equity, which is based on the price per share paid by investors as of right now. The market value of equity is different from the book value of equity because it represents exactly what investors would be willing to pay immediately for the firm's equity. The market value of equity should be very close to the value of the firm's discounted cash flows. Uh, we'll talk about those later in this class. Now, if a firm has debt, then we would typically subtract the value of the debt from the discounted value of the firm's future cash flows in order to arrive at the market value or market cap of this firm's equity. The market value of equity is infinitely more important to a firm's manager and shareholders than its book value of equity. Why? Well, I'll explain that right now. So let's say that you are the CEO of Verizon and you're considering buying T-Mobile. And T-Mobile's book value of debt and equity are $12 billion and $5 billion, respectively. T-Mobile's market value of debt and equity are $12 billion and $36 billion, respectively. How much will you have to pay to purchase T-Mobile? Well, 
you would want to compensate T-Mobile shareholders for their equity, so their shares, outstanding. If you try to offer them only $5 billion, they're going to immediately reject that offer. Why? It's because the market value of those shares, the value that they could sell those shares for today, is $36 billion. So the reason we care as investors and the reason why the CEO of a firm cares so much about the market value of the equity is because it represents exactly what those shares are actually worth, as opposed to the historical, as we sometimes say, fiction of the book equity number. In finance, we typically deal with market valuation as opposed to what's listed on the firm's balance sheet. Now, there is a very strong and important relationship between the market value of equity and the book value of equity in finance. We often compute a ratio called the market to book ratio, which is just market value of equity divided by book value of equity. The higher this ratio, the more investment opportunities investors see for the firm. The reason for this is that we're scaling market value of equity by what is commonly seen as a historical measure of shareholder value. Typically, market to book ratios are between 1.5 and 3. If you have an IPO firm or a firm with great growth prospects, it might have a market to book ratio as high as 5 or 10, indicating that investors would be far more willing to pay for a dollar of this firm's book equity than they would for another company with a lower market to book ratio. Now, there are a number of concerns I want to note with regard to the balance sheet specifically. First off, the book value of equity listed on the balance sheet is not the market value. In finance, we care mostly about the market value of equity, and the only time we really use book value of equity is when we're using or computing some ratio. Now, another point to note is that the cash line item is very significant because cash is far more liquid than a lot of the other assets on the firm's balance sheet. Uh, for considering acquiring a particular company, and we see that it has a large amount of cash on hand. This would tell us a lot of things, but it's typically a very good thing for us as acquirers. Next, the numbers on the balance sheet are open to manipulation by a firm's accountants and managers. I'll give you an example. Let's say we want to know what the value of the inventory is for this firm. Well, it might be important to note whether this firm is using the FIFO or the LIFO method of expensing inventory. Uh, so those stand for first in, first out, and last in, first out. Uh, so depending on that or a number of other accounting choices, the value of some of those line items is going to vary. Next, the balance sheet, as I've said a couple of times already, is a snapshot of the firm's financial position. It doesn't tell us the financial position of the firm over the lifetime of the firm or even over the course of a year or a quarter. Some firms operate in extremely cyclical industries, like the retail industry or, say, if we're looking at a firm that provides, that operates a ski resort, that firm is going to have line items that are far different between the winter quarter and the summer quarter. Next, we have the income statement. And the income statement reports the firm's revenues, expenses, and accounting earnings over a specific period, generally either one fiscal quarter or one fiscal year. For example, please see Google's income statement for fiscal year 2013, which I've provided in today's spreadsheet. I provided comments on the majority of the line items so you get a sense of where those numbers come from. Uh, to learn more about each of those line items, you can hover your mouth, mouse pointer over the name of each line item. Now, I do have a few points to make on the parts of the income statement. A firm faces a number of costs when it produces goods. However, they can often be broken up into two different categories, fixed and variable costs. Fixed costs are costs associated with the purchase of equipment and other long-term assets. Variable costs are costs which only increase when you produce an initial unit. Uh, variable costs include items like input material costs, labor expenses, administration expenses, and warehouse overhead. On Google's income statement, most variable costs will be reflected on the cost of revenue total line item. Uh, the rest would be reflected on the selling general and administrative, or SG&A, expense line item, which we can see if we go over to 
Google's income statement. So here's their cost of revenue total. And that's always going to come right below their total revenue, which is our top item. Uh, sometimes this total revenue item is referred to as total sales, depending on the firm. And down here we have our SG&A expense. Now, depending on the firm, some firms are going to lump in cost of revenue or cost of goods sold in with SG&A expense. So sometimes you'll just see a total cost of goods sold. It really depends on the firm. I know I've mentioned depreciation before, but I'm going to mention again since it appears on the income statement. Now, depreciation is an expense which we subtract from total sales revenue. However, we're not paying anything out. Depreciation is an accounting fiction which is used to capture the idea that the value of our assets decreases the longer we hold them. For example, a company car could be sold for $20,000 just after we bought it, but likely much less if we had held it for two or three years. Because depreciation is not a cash flow, we add it back in when we're calculating our free cash flows. All right, so now we've talked about the income statement. Now, there are some issues with the income statement, and they're fairly similar to the issues that I mentioned with the balance sheet. Uh, first off, accounting practices can vary. For example, does the firm use LIFO or FIFO to calculate the value of the inventory it just sold? Uh, depending on that method, our bottom line is going to be affected. Uh, second, it may be the case that the firm issues debt as opposed to equity to raise cash to fund its operations. The reason this is important for us when we're looking at the income statement is because if a firm borrows money, it typically has to make interest payments or payments to its creditor. Those interest payments are tax deductible, meaning that whatever the firm pays out in interest to its creditor decreases that firm's taxable income and grows the firm's net income. Now, finally, there I, I should mention that there are a, a huge number of other accounting choices that can affect the bottom line. Uh, whether the firm uses GAAP accounting methods or IFRS accounting methods can really throw off the numbers for the net income. Now, the reason I mention all of this stuff is because you're in a finance class. This is not accounting. In finance, we focus far more on the actual cash flow that a firm's shareholders receive. We try to overlook or get around the accounting choices that are being made and just determine exactly how much cash flow shareholders will receive while they own those shares. Uh, you're going to see this time and again, but I'm going to start off by saying this and we'll go through in later chapters and actually calculate the amount of cash flow that a, a shareholder is expected to receive. All right, now to conclude this first part of our second chapter, financial statements can provide a host of useful information. Usually we tend to focus on the balance sheet and the income statement. And the balance sheet, as I've noted several times, is a snapshot of the firm's operations at a singular point in time. The income statement, however, is essentially a statement that details the firm's profit and total revenue over a, over a period of time, so a quarter or a year. And because accountants have some discretion when creating those financial statements, we tend to focus on cash flows in finance.